Find us. Oh, the guy that Zane was talking to? Yeah. The guy in Zane's bed. Yes. 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 Photography and screenwriting before moving professionally into motion graphics, animation, and 3D, 3D design. Uh, and in San Francisco, she is part of the Mad Madison Square Garden Ventures um, software team, where she engineers multi server media playback systems for monumental scale interactive uh, experiences. Um, and she's traveled the world uh, with clients such as Marvel, Verizon, Dell, Adidas, Toyota, Urban Outfitters. Uh, and San Francisco Parks Department, uh, MGM, and many more. And so today she'll be guiding us through that journey. And uh, so join me in welcoming Javier. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for so graciously inviting me into your classroom space. It's lovely to be here and wonderful to meet all of y'all. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tavia. I am a bunch of things, including a digital artist, an engineer, um, creative technologist, an animator, uh, illustrator, a dancer. I've done quite a bit of different things in my life. And um, I found that my journey to getting to where I am now has been um, one of many journeys that I have uh, come across in my own journeys. I've met and talked with a lot of different people who have entered into this field in very different ways than me. I actually have no formal training in the kind of work that I'm doing right now. Uh, that is things like software development, um, but I have, through my own curiosity and interests, I've moved from illustration and sort of more aesthetic art and gradually kind of moved into a full-on software development, and that journey has been quite, quite an interesting one. So when I was approached to do this talk, um, I had to think of a title for this, and I chose from Cartoons to Creative Technology to kind of underline the fact that there's many different venues um, and different ways that a person can enter into this kind of new media field. So not to worry, everybody, there's plenty of routes in. And to kind of highlight that, I like to kind of start with the software, of because most of the time when I've gotten involved with a company to do some kind of installation, they're looking for a very specific skill set, somebody who knows how to do, uh, how to operate something, how to create content within a certain uh, software suite. And I've made this image here to kind of describe to you, this certainly is not extensive, but it's to kind of describe all the different uh, pieces of software that go, that I've encountered in my own journey. Uh, this like kind of a red to, bluish areas all media production work and a lot of this blue area over here is mostly coding and there's a lot of event and production work that can kind of fall in this sort of pinkish and purplish area on this chart um, so that being said uh, there's a lot of fascination with people who work in a professional environment to learn all of it and uh, that's definitely not necessary to get started i just think it's a good idea to kind of see what it is that you're drawn to and start learning it because um, you'll naturally find yourself drawn towards uh, certain disciplines and you'll find avenues that are the path of least resistance towards what it is that you want to do. It'll happen naturally. And also to highlight this, this is a non-exhaustive list of all the different types of jobs or titles that I've encountered in my professional career. And this, um, there are as many different titles and configurations of titles as there are pieces of software, um, different things like producers being a developer. Uh, it might not even be as broad or general as like a production artist. They might be looking for a 
Unity artist or maybe a Cinema 4D artist. Just again, to highlight, there's many different ways and avenues that you can kind of enter into this field. So um, my story in particular actually starts on the sketchbook. I initially got into doing art um, by drawing and illustrating. I was very much into anime and cartoons at the time that I was getting started on this stuff. And I like to fill, I mean, just uh, bookshelves full of it. I still have them to this day, and every once in a while I'll flip back through it for um, kind of ideas, things of that sort. And I had initially started making comic books and had even gotten some things published in newspapers. And this is an example of, uh, I did stuff for newspapers as well as um, different um, books as well. And I initially thought that when I had gotten, gotten start, started in this uh, field that I would end up doing something more like concept art for movies, uh, especially because I had found digital illustration in Photoshop and GIMP. I know that like, those are like, pretty common suites for this sort of stuff. And so I would spend a lot of time studying shadow. I actually went to school for drawing and painting initially. And um, I don't know, I guess just falling in love with comic book art and animation is what made me want to move into learning how to do animation because I wanted to make my characters move and come to life. And so my first step into doing that was actually doing work for um, a webcomic called Homestuck, which uh, was sort of an in-browser web-based um, storyline that where the users could have input for what that is they wanted to happen next. Oh, I see. I see over there. <laughs> see, mouthing home stuff. Um, but that was a, my first kind of multimedia, uh, my first step into sort of a multimedia experience because they were looking for production artists to make assets that would then be co collected together and comp together into full-on animations that would then be hosted in sort of a web, web browser. And it's kind of an example of what that is. We got, um, this used to be a Flash-based game, but it has been replaced with um, a pre-recorded animation of what it was like to go through that game. And a lot of the work I had done was in the background. We'll see if this will pick up or not. A lot of the work I had done was in the background of this pixel art game of characters moving about. Thank you. So a lot of the trees and stuff back here. This is just, again, like a pre-recording. Uh, if you do have Flash enabled on your thing, you can totally locate yourself to this uh, web URL and click on Show Me Anyway, and it should take you to over to the Flash game so you can play it yourself. So, yeah. Can you explain what Flash is for the young? <laughs> I don't even know because if I Flash can. Flash is like fully absolute. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can because, frankly, I didn't, um, I didn't ever really understand what Flash was even when it was popular. It's just a way, I guess, to play back videos inside of a browser, a web browser. Is that like mostly you could it? code. Yeah, like that's like right. Action script. Oh yeah, hundred percent. You could totally um, make your own flash animations and put them inside of a browser if you um, code, which is some a string of um, focus that would continually show itself throughout my own career. Is the uh, importance of learning how to code. Just as an FYI, y'all. So let's see. Moving from Homestuck, I had done just a bunch of different illustrations, um, different animations. Again, there was a, a music team that required a lot of um, what they call it uh, cover art for their music, so I would illustrate for those things, and all the while practicing how to make assets and how to collaborate with a group of people, which is a very important skill set. Also, moving into a professional space. So some samples of my work during this time. Stuff. Uh, eventually, I got to the point where I did want to make these images move. I was in admiration of a lot of the animators I was working with. So I decided to learn both 2D and 3D animation through using After Effects and Cinema 4D, initially by making my own VJ loops. And I've got a couple of those to share for you now. So these just will loop continuously. So there was um, about a year and a half of 
uh, my life where I spent every day making a piece of art, and the goal of which was to teach myself how to animate, how to work in a 3D program, and the more important thing was to learn something new every day. That could have been, how do I use this tool in a way? How does this spline tool work inside of Cinema 4D? It also could have been a more compositional focus or maybe a palette focus. I wanted to work with these colors. Or even sometimes, like a, I just wanted to make a joke with an image or tell some kind of narrative in some way. And so every day, no matter what it was that I made, I had to check off this box of I've learned new things. And also, it was nice to get some VJ clips along the way, because at the time, I had picked up VJ work in Austin, Texas, which is where I had moved from to move to San Francisco. So here's some more examples. And I'm a little bit of a, a jokester, so you'll, you'll definitely see that part of my work. <laughs> And it's, it just kind of got to be really fun, you know, where you could just play jokes with yourself, um, kind of come up with um, inside jokes. Eventually, once you start doing things a lot, you find different ways of entertaining yourself. This one's one of my favorite um, loops that I made for BJ. A lot of positive and negative space. That was like a lot of what I was working with here. And it would be interesting to see the way that even art school had come to inform a lot of the, the influences in the work. Um, and as I would go along, I would find things like, especially in this one is a good example of it. This is uh, what we're looking at is instancing or cloning, which is something that you'll see in Cinema 4D and just in a variety of different programs, including um, Touch Designer, which is one that I use all the time. And uh, this again is another instance where I'm running into the importance of learning how to code and how to think mathematically. And think in terms of arrays and how to disperse data across a group without any, um, without any focus on one individual piece, but how to look at the group as a whole and how to program for your composition as a whole. Um, some more examples of some cool loops that made. I really like saturated colors. I really like very cartoonish stuff, as you can see. Even even after, even after moving into 3D programming, I still found cartoons to kind of eventually come back in one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I collaborated with a writer on this one. So he wrote the line and I animated it. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. I don't think I can make art better than this, y'all. Yeah. And some of them weren't as um, overt like that, but very fun. Um, you know, this one in this case was more of a focus on a primary color palette. Primary color palette and trying to find ways of making engaging VJ loops that could be applied to a variety of different surfaces. So all along the while I was doing this, this daily work, not only was I doing 2D and 3D animation and sort of um, uh, programs that make what is what I call baked animation, I don't know if that's a, a term that y'all use, great, um, that I would make a lot of uh, VJ loops that were baked ultimately, and, but through that exploration and eventually moving into um, motion graphics professionally, I also had been introduced to Touch Designer at that time. And I was curious as to why it was certain pieces of media were being produced with one piece of software versus another, and what each one had to offer. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple more VJ loops before I do the interactive work. I also have a reel to show you. This one's called VHS, VHS Heartbreak, and I think y'all are a little too young to have known what VHS is, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This isn't true VHS, right? Because I'm mimicking VHS using After Effects filters, which is just great. <laughs> This 
this one was Cinema 4D for sure. They are daily, they are daily. And, but the, the actual day-to-day -day would be different because some days I would be out working a lot and I only had maybe an hour to crank out something. And they weren't always animations either. Sometimes they were just renders. And um, so it could, it could vary between, I mean, eight hours to 30 minutes, depending on how much time was available. And also kind of what it was I was focusing on. So I would bounce between Cinema 4D and Touch Designer. A lot of my focus in touch designer was what can be made with it um, and how can I make it efficiently because um, I'm sure you all use touch designer, right? So, right? Great. So I'm sure you all know the importance of the performance of your uh, program and whether or not uh, you can get it to run at 60 FPS. Um, so uh, some of my explorations would be what can I, what can I make that's visually interesting and how can I make it most efficiently? So in that case, I would use like the geometry comps uh, instancing in a lot of those cases, and only be using primitive the primitive sops inside of Touch Designer to see like what can I use with that. In some cases, I would make custom meshes and import them, but not always. Uh, here's another example of something I made with Touch Designer, and this again was uh, I was actually really kind of taken with what could be done with coding and mathematics. It sort of felt like sketching, but faster. And it didn't have the same fluidity as having a pencil in your hand and imagining something that you could then put down on a piece of paper. But the limitations of that and thinking in more in terms of numbers actually kind of opened up a whole different way of approaching how to make art and how to, I don't know, I guess approach concepting for those things. So here's a couple more examples. So a lot of this work had kind of resulted in um, this huge body of work. And I'm going to show you uh, something very fun for me. This is my, the next thing I'm about to show you is my, I think, 2015 reel of my motion graphics work. And this includes uh, some uh, 2D and 3D motion graphics uh, commercials that I had made, uh, some of my interactive work, and other stuff. So here we go. It's a little embarrassing for me. But it's a good snippet of the work I was doing at that time. I would find myself at this point in my career doing both motion graphics and programming, which are very different things, right? You're, you can make content, obviously, through um, generative art and other sorts of approaches using your computer. Um, and you can also make interactive playback systems, which is a whole separate sort of discipline where you have to start to think about how you can create and disperse systems across many different computers, all with the intent of creating one giant image at the end of it. So kind of being in this weird space, I was at a crossroads between art and technology. Like I really kind of felt like I was in that spot. And at that time, I started to freelance with a couple of different companies doing both motion graphics and interactive design. And that would take me to a company called Dot Dot Dash. I'm gonna show you work over here. 
in, so in Austin, Texas, there is a festival called South by Southwest. And uh, we were hired to video map a portion of a car that was life-size. So this was uh, meant to uh, advertise the 2016 Toyota Prius. And for this installation, I uh, made content for two different walls and something that was called the Fader Fort. So on one wall, there was, well, the whole space was a silent disco. So you can put on some headphones and go in there and kind of rock out and dance a little bit. And on one side of the wall, there was a dance floor. And on, projected on that wall was some generative art that was beat reactive to the music that people were listening to. So they could kind of get down and dance and be like, yes, this is amazing. Meanwhile, if you take off the headphones, you hear like awkward shuffling and breathing. Anyway, it was just great fun. And on the other wall was a full-size uh, replica of uh, the 2016 Toyota Prius, or I should say like a fifth of it. It was sort of almost like a relief coming out of the wall, but as far as standing next to it, it felt like you were standing right next to a car. So I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. This is also a video that kind of captures the space as well, like the surrounding area. I had nothing to do with this sculpture here, but this was a very cool one. It was also audio reactive. That's me. And there's Cam Schnapper. Maybe you guys have used that before. Yeah, very, very reliable tool. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so the challenge of this one, the challenge of this project was to create um, a blend of baked and generative content, which was, I kind of felt like a perfect hybrid of my two skill sets. I think they'll also show the dance floor here in a second. Pause it for you. Here we go. There's the money shot. Yeah. And that's the autoreactive dance floor. So I also did this project in collaboration with a gentleman named Dominic Barrett, uh, who's so located, I think, in New York now. So, so we, we had done collaboration to, we split the generative art uh, pretty evenly, and I was doing a little bit of the generative art, a little bit of playback engineering. Efficiency. Uh, I don't know, have, have you all worked with proxies and Kim Schnapper at all? We just work with one mesh. What? One mesh, great. Um, so, what? One of the things that, one of the th first steps that I had to do when I got there. Let me fast forward to the thing so you can actually see it. One of the first things that I did for this was, I was handed a very high poly mesh, and when you in, when you import a high poly mesh in with the Cam Snapper, it can really slow down performance, especially when you're trying to get something that aligned just perfectly. And so I took in that mesh prior to ingesting it into Cam Schnapper or any touch designer network. And I had to sort of re-topologize it to reduce the amount of polygons so that it would perform more efficiently when I was actually using the calibration technique. And so that took uh, quite a bit of time to do. It's like 3D work is a very important step in this sort of work. So if you feel more inclined towards 3D work, not to worry, there's plenty of opportunities to um, find yourself in sort of a, a pipeline of this sort. So I would re-topologize it and get these meshes ready for calibration. In addition to that, I also did actual animation inside of Cinema 4D with the high poly mesh to make it look as though the car was cruising through down a, um, a highway with lights passing. This one doesn't really highlight it here. I think I saw one a little bit later on when we get there. That's a little bit more of the generative work. So using the mesh, I would, um, there you go, right there. Like for the couple of seconds you see it. I did not edit this, by the way. 
these reflections right here. Something that I had to do with the high poly mesh inside of Cinema 4D, but the output was ultimately baked content that would then be put back onto the model using a UV map. And in addition to that, the same mesh that I was using for, not for calibration, but for the animation, I would also input into Touch Designer in order to do generative content, um, a little bit more like that, with particles and stuff kind of hitting the car and bouncing down and off. So I found that this project in particular was a great crossroads of these two disciplines. Um, and uh, that's kind of the thing about this sort of work, is that it's inherently a multidisciplinary sort of discipline. I know that's like a weird sentence to say. But there's lots of different types of uh, strengths a person can have to aid towards this end result. Um, and now I do very much, I've kind of gone from this aesthetic sort of point of view and have worked in the interactive field now more so I'm doing software development now at this point. So through this exploration and this curiosity about how can I make better work, I found that coding was something that was really, really essential towards that end goal. And it's something that I use all the time, every day now. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. I don't know. That's mostly what I got. started with like what's your procedure kind of to get to that end of the project like do you see the do you kind of imagine like what you wanted first or do you just start with something or so i think it's a combination of a couple of things usually the initial idea like the spark of uh inspiration that kind of kicks things off is absolutely what would launch me off into a project to begin with and would keep me kind of to the heart of what I wanted the message of that piece to be. But there always comes a time in which actually executing on the thing would mean having to get a little bit real about what are the what are my capabilities and what I can do, and also what tools do I have access to. And I've actually kind of come to appreciate the bounding box of design, what where the limitations of what I can actually do um, will help to inform design. So um, that could be, like, for instance, I know this is like kind of an easy thing, but Touch Designer is great for a lot of things. It can render images, but it can't do the kind of um, sort of reflections or something that we might see in something like Unreal Engine. But uh, that could still be, knowing that and keeping that in mind and knowing that you're going to be using something with Touch Designer, you can at least know how to design for something aesthetically if that's something that you know you or have to use or want to use for whatever reason. It might not even be an aesthetic choice. It might be that Touch Designer is one of the only tools that can be used to do the level of interactivity that I'm looking to do, and therefore I am bound by what it can output or what it can uh, import or export. So it's, it's a little combination of uh, a little bit of inspiration, certainly, in order to get the project going at all, but also um, finding inspiration in the limitations of the tools that I'm using and not letting that necessarily drag me down, but opening the door for what can I do with this tool. Does that answer your question? I love collaborating with my coworkers because everybody has a different focus and a different strength. And uh, the times that I felt most ignited in the collaboration or been the times when I've um, helped to kind of translate how something can be done between, like, a, say, a technical director and a 3D specialist who are both working on a projection design to figure out how far away, say, like a projector needs to be from a subject in order for it to look like um, an image that is not made of pixels. And so that uh, will, on an organic form, for instance, it might mean discussing how to make the UV map, because we have only so many projectors to cover certain 
sides of an organic form. And so that necessitates discussions between two, four or five disciplines and having those, that discussion is some of the, it's like just the best thing in the whole world. That's, that's a, totally what I look forward to doing. I do enjoy the design and challenge of um, uh, programming and figuring out how to make an interactive piece, but the collaboration's really what make it the other people you work with. Thank you. Were studying uh, fine arts? Is it? Yeah. So I was studying drawing and painting initially at the University um, of North Texas, okay. and then I moved into video production when I moved to Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So I never got any formal training on interactive arts, and I was going to say it's really cool that y'all get to kind of get exposed to this stuff early on because I did not have that. I had to figure out everything on my own. especially because it's sort of an evolving one. There's not really a, a book or a set of terms um, that could be used to describe this work because it's evolving all the time. And the software and things that, and the titles that you might be using now might change in like a week or something. But I'd say the one title that I found to be the most common nowadays uh, would be just creative technology or a creative technologist or um, something of that sort. But I've also heard like new media artist or gosh, what was one of the ones I had put down? I can't remember. It was like way back at the start. <laughs> Again, like I just encountered every one of these titles. Um, yeah, augmented reality developer. Developer is a good one. Um, I would say creative technologist is probably the biggest umbrella term without getting more specific than that. And then this isn't part is given like where you started of everything you use, stick to style, you know, technological approach, documentation style, everything kind of comes into the design. That's a really fantastic question. Um, well, I have found that despite all the different mediums that I've worked in, there's always this very high saturated um, sort of palette I've chosen and very big and obvious shapes and um, very bold compositions. That, that sort of style has followed me throughout every one of my projects, no matter what. Um, but I found that the thing that's informed, the, the stuff that's informed my style the most are the limitations of the tools that I'm using. Because that's actually the thing that I kind of look for first whenever I'm learning a new skill, is like where, where are the bounds of what this can accomplish? Because then I can figure out where, where does this, um, piece of software end and another, another one begin, or why would I choose this one versus another one? And sometimes those limitations will mean that I don't get to do stuff the way that I'm used to or I'm comfortable to. Uh, but at least in terms of the aesthetic, that the high, the high saturation and big bold compositions has always stayed the same. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. happening right now, uh, and maybe you, you don't know yet, but I, I'm curious if you have an idea of kind of a thought of what would be that next trend or that next shift. If you see anything already happening right now uh, in what you're doing uh, day to day, uh, what do you feel like it's going to be the next step? No, know, that's, that's a hard one to answer. Um, I felt myself kind of more inclined towards moving a little bit more in the art direction way of things, but that's mostly because my day-to-day -day as a developer doesn't expose me as much to design, and that's something that I've spent years and years and years doing. And so to be able to get to a spot that somehow works in a little bit of uh, development as well as being able to design and decide how something will look, or even motion design of some kind, it's something that I want to do, but I don't know what to call that. <laughs> like, I really have no it's idea. Integrated. Yeah, like a, exactly. It's definitely integrated. And that is, again, like kind of a testament to, like, the fact that there's not really one word that can be used to describe this. I've heard new media or creative technology. I've heard a lot of different things. And I 
expect that that title would change over time with the development of new technologies and new techniques and maybe just new forms of art that we haven't even seen yet. silly, fun learning projects or like experimental stuff? When I have time, uh, lately, I've actually found myself going back to drawing more in a sketchbook because I look at a screen so much that it's almost essential for me to disengage from looking at pixels all day and just get back to something a little bit more um, direct, I guess. Uh, but I still do create art. Um, Nowadays, I also dance a lot, so I like to go and take different dance classes and study what choreography can offer. Um, and there's definitely some stuff cooking up in my brain. Let's see how we can mesh these worlds together. Did you post them anywhere to any sites? Yeah. So, what? Yeah. What sites would you uh, recommend for doing that kind of thing? There's my website here, taviamora.com. You'll see all these tiles here. And if you go down, you can go to my dailies tile. And this is not extensive. This kind of just describes the uh, places, the time, and kind of my thought process moving through it. So there's some examples of when I, when I had done it and the title therein and what it is I was looking to do during this process. But if you really want to see like every single piece of art, you can go to my Instagram, which... Uh, this is actually kind of fun. I, I don't mind talking about this a little bit longer if you guys don't mind listening. Um, this is uh, some of the stuff that I had done towards the end of my dailies, where I began to just kind of find myself doing what I call the long mural, which is just a co one continuous piece of art that will somehow eventually kind of ooze into one another. Although when I had started it, it was actually the typical Instagram uh, format where there's a different image every day. I just kind of found myself like interested in making bigger pieces and instead of only spending 30 minutes you know 30 minutes to eight hours a day only on one piece I wanted to spend more time as I got more fluent with it um, and so the further back we go the shorter the pieces get and the more you're going to see stuff that I had to complete in one day so my Instagram is I beef alone for anybody who wants to go and look at all these and there are a lot of different ways that this had evolved. Some of them were strictly Cinema 4D, some of them were strictly touch designer, and others were combinations of photography, for example. Um, that's one I like. One that combines photography as well as uh, 3D. So this is an example of two of them. This is the super bloom that happened in 2017. I went on a road trip and took a bunch of pictures and use those as the basis for compositing 3D elements that were not there previously. Is that like, did you take like an, uh, a 360 um, picture like there to get the HDRI for that? Or? I actually, no, I had a, like a first generation iPad, I think, so it was, it was not like the best quality stuff. Um, but that's actually a really good idea is doing the 360 compositing. Yeah. It's just some of my favorite pieces. Just The back you go, the more you can see some of my like kind of weirder and like funnier kind of stuff where I'm still compositing stuff. It's a bus in San Francisco, it's kind of menacing to me that day. It's a super bloom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, just like, I was always inspired by what was around me. And they kind of did become a little bit of like a diary, almost, uh, from day to day. I got a cool, like, looking thing. Yeah. That was touch design, that's like a displacement technique. Thank you so much, Savia. I think some distancing measures here. I think that's literally exactly where I wanted to do it. I wanted to.
every day make like something in the ashes actually like have a bottle of